Now, a couple of housekeeping uh, things about the fall. We're very excited. Tonight is kicking off a really full fall of special programs here at the museum. One of the things we're most excited about is the opening of our new special exhibition called Liberty, Don Traoni's Revolutionary War Paintings. Now, if you have visited a National Park Service or other historic site dealing with any period of American history, American military history from Jamestown to Appomattox, you are familiar with the artistic work of Don Traoni who um, is a you know, living, active artist today, one of the most accomplished narrative military history artists um, in the last century. He's actually a, a graduate of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts here in Philadelphia back in the early 70s. Again, paints a wide variety of subjects, but his heart, his passion has always been the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War, and that sort of answering that question of what did the Revolutionary War look like? But despite publishing numerous books, having his works used to illustrate historic exhibits um, and being used in publications. Don's original works of art have never actually been brought together and displayed in a single exhibition. And so literally beneath our feet on the, the ground floor of the museum in our Patriots Gallery, uh, Amy Newell's team is installing 40 original works of art by Don Troiani, almost 50 original objects, so original objects both from Don's personal collection of Revolutionary War artifacts as well as those from the museum's collection and um, other private collectors. So this is going to be an incredible experience. There's a book. You can buy it on the website. Um, uh, this is the catalog for the exhibition, so all the artwork and objects that will be on display in the museum are in the book. It's, you can buy it uh, through the museum's website. It's also available uh, in our gift shop downstairs. You can see you're definitely going to want to buy that. Now, on October 14th, for those of you who are Revolution Society and George Washington Council members, you'll get, and uh, you probably have already received, an invitation to a special preview opening. Don Traiani himself will be there along with our lenders to the exhibition and again our sort of nearest and dearest supporters. There is still time to join and if you are interested, uh, please do speak to any of our members uh, of the staff here or just uh, go on the website and check out that uh, opportunity. For those of you who are regular members of the museum, we have an entire day, the following day on the 15th of October, that is a members only preview day. Uh, for liberty, and so you'll be able to, to enjoy that uh, with your fellow supporters of the museum, members of the museum. And then starting Saturday the 16th, that exhibition will run until Labor Day of 2022, so it's a very long run uh, here at the museum, and I guarantee you're going to want to come back often. So if you're not a member yet, become a member. Now our next Read the Revolution, um, again, uh, is going to be a hybrid, so there will be an online opportunity to watch as well. And that's Gordon S. Wood. Um, if you are interested in history and do not know who Gordon Wood is, um, I almost don't know what to say. He is one of the towering eminences in uh, historical scholarship about the revolution. He has this new book out, Power and Liberty, Constitutionalism in the American Revolution. Gordon will be here on the 26th of October. You're definitely going to want to be in this room uh, to, to see him in person, and that is going to be absolutely fabulous. Now, for those of you who are here in person tonight, uh, you've enjoyed a special treat that's over on the side of the gallery. Um, one of the things we sort of talked about through the COVID times when we imagined being able to gather back together again and knowing that we would have these hybrid events was trying to do something a little bit special to induce uh, people to, to, to come here to the museum rather than sit at home and watch online. So we decided to do two things. One was to add a cash bar, and I'm pleased to report that that seems to have been popular this evening, uh, and to try to bring objects out that tie to the subject of uh, the presentations in uh, Liberty here. Now normally we would bring an object from our own collection, but we were really uh, grateful that our friends at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and Dr. David Brigham and David, will you wave to us all here in the back, um, were, made it possible for us to display just for tonight in person the Revolutionary War Diary of Sergeant Major uh, Hawkins. Now, you're going to hear a lot about him tonight here in Dr. Mayer's um, speech, but it's a great 
reminder of the power of being in the presence of these real things. Of course, you all understand that coming here uh, to the museum. The Historical Society, one of the oldest and most venerable cultural organizations in the city, if you are not familiar with them, their website is easy, easy HSP for Historical Society of Pennsylvania dot O-R-G, uh, HSP dot org. And they are a member organization. I'd encourage all of you to, to, you know, to get involved. This is one of really the nation's greatest archives relating to the Revolutionary Era and the Revolutionary War. There's, it's almost impossible to write a book about this subject and not spend time at HSP. And I know Holly uh, certainly has spent lots of time in the reading room there uh, as well, which I'm sure you'll uh, talk about. But anyway, thanks to you, David, and our friends at the Historical Society for making it possible to see the diary here in person. Now, before I introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Holly A. Mayer, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for the Read the Revolution series, the Haverford Trust Company. And this has been, for you regulars, you know, this has been a, a long uh, relationship since the museum opened and, and even uh, beforehand. These are very near and dear supporters of the museum. And I'm going to invite uh, Tim Gillespie up uh, on behalf of the Haverford Trust, in addition to being vice president and uh, uh, director of client management, most importantly, he and his wife Susan sitting next to him are very active members of our Revolution Society and are basically here at all of our events. So you should get to know both of them. Marvelous people. And uh, Tim, would you like to come up and say a few words? I'll try not to fall off. Thank you, Scott. Require yeah, another yes, knee yes. replacement. Yeah, you don't, <laughs> please don't do that. One, one is enough for one year. Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. As Scott noted, my name is Tim Gillespie, and, and I am pleased to be here tonight representing Haverford Trust. Uh, as Scott also referenced, my wonderful wife, Susan, is sitting in the front row, uh, and she's here with me tonight. And she and I have been personally involved here with the museum since before there was a museum, literally before there was a building. Uh, we, we found this to be a, just a passion that we have just embraced, and, and we love this place. Um, we love the staff. Uh, they're an outstanding group of individuals, exceptional. Um, and it feels really, really good to be back here tonight, Scott. So, so thank you for having us here. In terms of Haverford Trust, for more than 40 years, we have been a privately owned personal trust and wealth management company based in Radnor, Pennsylvania. We currently manage about $14 billion on behalf of our individual and institutional clients. And while we have clients in nearly all 50 states, we pride ourselves on being a local firm with commitments to this region. That commitment includes supporting organizations in this community and there is no more important organization in this community to us than the Museum of the American Revolution. Suffice it to say, this museum has filled a critical civic and historical niche in the city, and Haverford is proud to once again sponsor the, the, the amazing Read the Revolution program this year. We thank you all for being here this evening, and we look forward to the presentation and comments from Dr. Mayer tonight. And with that, I will yield the microphone back to Scott, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be able to uh, introduce Dr. Holly A. Mayer, who has uh, been a dear friend of mine for decades now. We were tr catching up a little bit on the terrace earlier, trying to calculate the years, but it's been, it was back in the 1900s uh, when we, we first met <laughs> one another. Doesn't that amazing how that sounds now? Uh, 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 Holly, Dr. Mayer, is now a professor emerita from the uh, McAnulty College and the Graduate School of Liberal Arts at Duquesne University in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, where she taught for many decades. She did, um, I think, two stints as, uh, as um, uh, chair of the history department there after joining Duquesne, uh, after receiving your PhD at the uh, College of William and Mary. Uh, she also has served as the visiting Harold K. Johnson Chair of Military History at the U.S. Army War College out in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, at the Carlisle Barracks, and is currently, during this academic year, uh, at West Point, where she's serving as the Charles Bowl Ewing Visitor Professor of History. She is also um, uh, has been commissioned, went through ROTC, and served in the U.S. Army um, Reserves, and so she stands long time ago, but you still stand fairly straight. You're recognizable as a military person still. Uh, she is the author of a, a whole slew of articles about the sort of military and history, uh, historical, um, I'm sorry, 
the military, political, social sort of intersections of history in the era of the American Revolution and the colonial era. Her first book, uh, Belonging to the Army, Camp Followers and Community during the American Revolution, still in print and absolutely an essential text for studying this period of time. But she's here to talk tonight about her hot off the press, I think this is maybe literally hot off the press, uh, new book, Congress's Own, A Canadian Regiment, The Continental Army, and the American Union. Canada, what does Canada have to do with the American Revolution? So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Holly Mayer. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here with all of you and to share in this community of history and the revolution in particular, and to of course examine this particular very unusual regiment or an uncommon regiment for an uncommon revolution, as we could also say for it. So um, I'm starting off, and I just want to point out that that is an image. It is a painting from Don Cerrone that is on the cover of my book. So I figured I might as well say kudos to him as well for helping illustrate my book, as well as, of course, being here in many other his other illustrations and paintings in about a month that you will be able to see. So well worth it, wonderful. So with Congress's own, um, I want to talk a few things about the regiment in particular, and then actually spend more time talking about Sergeant Major John H. Hopkins, who was the person who introduced me to this regiment through his writings in that journal that I found at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So I wanted to take it a step further to talk about this with you, and make sure I'm going in the right direction here, is to pick up and talk about the Congress's own regiment, which actually went through about three or four different names through its lifetime. As this uncommon regiment, it was first formed actually in January of 1776, authorized by the Continental Congress for Moses Hazen as the colonel and Lieutenant Colonel Edward Antill as the second in command. And it was commissioned as the second Canadian regiment. So it brings us up to this point about why a Canadian regiment. And I asked students at time, did you know that Canada was involved? Well, yeah, there was an invasion. The Americans lost. They had to retreat from Quebec. You know, by June of 76, they're gone. And that was the end of Canada. Well, no, not really not by any means in here. But while the American invading force was up in Canada, it was already starting to recruit Canadians to join in this rebellion. Certainly the Continental Congress was sending out declarations to the Canadians, especially the French Canadians, essentially saying, come join us, rebel with us. You know, and you might think it goes back to the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so the French Canadians at one point had been certainly the enemies of most of the New Englanders and others who had been fighting colonial wars with the French and their Indian allies through a series of imperial conflicts. But at this point it was, let's invite the Canadians in because we truly want this to be a continental rebellion. Let us have a true continental Congress with Canadian representatives. Let us have a continental army, which includes Canadians as well, as we invite others to join us in what was first, of course, a rebellion, a defense of the rights of Americans or these continental provin provincials in the early part, and then after July of 76, ultimately a revolution for the independence of the country itself. So they were joining this, and the first regiment or the first Canadian was by James Livingston, who had already been in action up there, so he got the first Canadian, and Moses Hazen, got the second Canadian. So to give you a little bit of background on Moses Hazen, he had actually been in Rogers Rangers during the Seven Years' War, and then he had actually gotten a commission with the 44th Regiment of Foot, which ultimately led him to retire in the Montreal region and right around St. Jean in Canada itself. So I like to point this out is that here was an American who did get a British commission as opposed to Washington, who did not. And Hazen actually was really, really torn about which way he was going to go in this conflict. He was getting a pension 
from the British government for his service during the Seven Years' War. He was right there on the borderlands, if you can see it up there in Canada, up along St. Jean, just south of Montreal. Would he give up that pension? Would he give up those lands to join in this American rebellion? And at first he wasn't sure. He was really on the fence in those borderlands, which way he was going to go. Ultimately, in the end, of course, as we know, he decided to join with the Americans with the proviso that he could create his own regiment and that he had command of that regiment, the second Canadian regiment in this case. So Hazen is not the person, though, that I really want to talk about. I want to continue on with this regiment on a few other points. Second Canadian was then in the retreat from Canada, and at that point it had lost probably about half of its recruits on that retreat down to Crown Point and then Fort Ticonderoga and ultimately into Albany. Through the summer of 76, there was a true question as to whether or not these Canadian regiments would continue. Canada was not choosing to join in this rebellion. So why would you have this other Canadian regiment? The original idea behind it was that it would be like all the other colonies that became states, is it would have its own iteration of a regiment. But if it's not joining the rebellion, what are we doing with this regiment? Ultimately, what happened is that Congress, by September of 76, went back to Hazen, and he was really pushing for this, and said, yes, we will reauthorize your 2nd Canadian Regiment, that you can recruit among the Canadian refugees that were up around Albany, certainly recruit those that had come with the American forces to Ticonderoga and the like, but we're also authorizing you to recruit among all of the states. So here is another unique factor about this 2nd Canadian Regiment, is that it's allowed to recruit elsewhere. Well, this brings up the next point. How many people from elsewhere would actually want to join the Canadian Regiment? If they're from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, which is where they're trying to recruit. And in the middle of that, certainly by the end of 76, going into 77, we see then the advertisements going out, the recruiting going out for Congress's own regiment. This is not something necessarily that Congress itself had authorized. It seems to have come out of the regiment itself. I think it actually probably came from Lieutenant Colonel Edward Antill, who was part of this, because he was more of a thinker, I think, than Moses Hazen was, quite frankly. I, I see Hazen as the pugilist. He was always really rather irritating as an individual, from what I can see. I think his commanding officer saw him that. Certainly, General Knox, at the end of it, said that this was a man who was blessed with one of the most obstinate tempers he had ever seen. Um, but it was the kind of temper that meant that this regiment continued in action through the rest of the war. But given this, it starts going out for recruiting for Congress's own. So you can see what's going on here. You can't recruit for second Canadian among all of them, but you can for Congress's own guard. Here it's got elite status. This sounds really good. This is better than just simply, what, the first Pennsylvania, really? The first Virginia, why not Congress's own? And they did tremendously well. This regiment was authorized a thousand men, so much bigger than the common Continental Infantry Regiment. But it was authorized a thousand, and by the spring of 77, it was hitting close to 900 men had enlisted in this regiment. Now, did they all stay? Absolutely not. See it in the records. Some of these guys joined up, put the cockade in their cap, got their bounty money, and headed off. So we've got that. They don't all stay, but it was tremendously successful recruiting under Congress's own. Unfortunately, this regiment also didn't always get along well with others. It got a rather infernal reputation in what it was doing, and Congress came back and said, you're not supposed to be calling it Congress's own. Um, so what's it supposed to be called? Back to Second Canadian? No, that's not doing recruiting. They tended to keep going, which was rather traditional, by Hazen's name. So it was Hazen's regiment for much of this war. But I also noted in some of the rosters that the captains in this regiment 
put little CORs under their rosters. Yeah, they're still part of Congress's own regiment in here. They knew how they were being recruited and how they were doing the recruiting in it. So they were incredibly successful under that name of Congress's own um, and continued to do that through the rest of the war, even after 1781 when James Livingston's regiment was demobilized Anybody left over from that, as well as other foreign recruits and soldiers, joined Hazen's regiment, and it became known as the Canadian Old Regiment. But let me tell you, that's not the name that's in the pension accounts. Hazen's regiment, Congress's own, um, is usually what you see. They, they picked up on that identity. So this leads me into the other one that I want to talk about, is this is how we get Sergeant Major John H. Hawkins is that they are recruiting among all of these other camps and garrisons up in the New York area. They are sending recruiting officers down here into Pennsylvania, into these other states, to the point where we've got soldiers from 11 of the states in the regiments. The only ones we don't have is I haven't found anybody from South Carolina or Georgia in this regiment, but they've got somebody from every other state so we've got this tremendously unique regiment that was called Canadian, was called Congress's own, but in some ways is a microcosm of the Continental Army itself, is that within its companies, and many of these companies were segregated by states, there were certainly at least two of the companies that were still French Canadian with officers who were still talking French with their soldiers, with all of these other recruits. So Sergeant Major John H. Hawkins, from what I can see, had actually first enlisted in 76 in a Pennsylvania unit, had served through it, and then in early January of 77, was up for reenlistment. So many of the soldiers who had enlisted in 76 were on short-term enlistments. The army going into 77 was again trying to recruit an army at this point and John H. Hawkins re-enlisted in Congress's own. As he re-enlisted, because he also had service time, and I think also because he was so literate, he was a writer, and I'll come to that in a moment, is that he was first given a corporal's enlistment and then very quickly within weeks was made a sergeant of the regiment. So John H. Hawkins, who is he? I think he is from Philadelphia. Yeah, um, some of this were, I won't say full assumptions, I am following clues. I spent probably way too much try time trying to find this guy in the records. Um, not always the easiest person to find. But from what I could understand, first of all, by reading his journal, is that he kept talking about his typographical brethren. He talked about printing offices. He talked about newspapers. He was holding newspapers and books in his knapsacks. In fact, when you look at that journal over there, they've got it on the page where he's talking about what he lost when he shucked his knapsack, when he was running before those brutish Highlanders to get away at Brandywine. And then part of it, when you look in there, he's talking about the papers and the quills and the books and the other things that he all had in his knapsack. So we've got this point that he was affiliated with printing in some form. So I went a little further in trying to do research and actually found a runaway ad for an apprentice that ran away from David Sellers' printing shop here in Philadelphia. This was back in 58. Um, and you just go, is this the same guy? It's John Hawkins, it's printing, it's Pennsylvania. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's very likely. Unfortunately, I couldn't nail it down for sure because he didn't say in his journal anywhere that he was a runaway apprentice. I wonder why. But um, there was this, and of course you get that little hint in this, looking at Hawkins in his story, is that he had run away from David Seller's shop. Well, David Seller had been the partner of Hall, David Hall, who had been a partner of Benjamin Franklin, who was the most notorious runaway apprentice of all, right? So you're going, oh, he's following that kind of tradition in some form or another. Well, from what it appears, he must have come back and served out 
his, his term as an apprentice or found something else because he's back here in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, but obviously not finding a job or his own independent shop. And thus, there he was enlisting in the Continental Army during the revolution in this thing. So we followed him in, but it also makes sense about why he would be a sergeant and certainly by a sergeant major. This is somebody who can keep the records, and he was. He was writing some of the orderly books. So we've got proof of this individual. But the big part was that journal. Now, of course, I looked at that journal and it's wonderful. And think about the material resources when you can touch this and I'm going, and I was, and you're, you're hearing this and going, 250 years ago, he was writing in this. And so from his pen and ink to my eyes, to see what's going on in his world at that time. He is speaking to me through the writing, and I, in turn, am trying to speak to you through his writing as well, to, to introduce you a bit to his world and what he saw in this revolution. So to take it from there. Um, again, he is there in a regiment that had probably close to 1,900 men serving in it over the course of the war. So again, unique and tremendously large of a unit in there. So I wanted to take it a step further from his journal in this is not, and we can come back to talking about this, certainly to answer your questions about the regiment itself, where it served and how. But what I really wanted to pick up on in here is that Coup's Country campaign. That's not as you know, familiar to many people looking at the revolution, just like a Canadian regiment is not so familiar. But one of the great things in Hawkins's journal is when he talks about what he sees as he is marching through this country. Who is he talking to? Who are some of the people? He is looking at the community that is becoming a nation and he is seeing what is similar and different as he is marching through it. So this brings me back to this point that I wanted to bring out here, is I'm picking up on another scholar's work, Benedict Anderson, who was talking about imagined political communities in this. And he premised that a nation is an imagined political community because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members. They will never meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. That image of the communion can exist at the same time through shared experiences or over time through events like this. So we are part of that imagined community that is part of the nation and we're doing it through him. So right now, as we work through his words, we are part of the imagined community of that developing nation in the 1770s, going through the 1780s. So we're sitting here in Philadelphia, here in 2021, in the Philadelphia that he was living in in 1776, that he marched through on the way to Yorktown, if you will. And, well, actually he sailed through it in 1781 and the like, but we're part of that imagined community. We're part of an imagined community right now as we're all finally getting to see each other. But then there are those of them who are over there, over Zoom. So I say, hi to you, you're part of this imagined community. We're all together to look at this particular history. But the other part that Benedict Anderson had mentioned in his is that when we form these communities, he talked about journeys or pilgrimages between times and statuses and places. So again, we're part of that journey. But these are meaning-creating experiences that create the experience of the imagined community. And so I'd like us to consider, too, that when we look at the Continental Army as it is marching through the United States, the new United States, they are creating this community and it's not all imagined. They are actually experiencing it. They are actually seeing it. They are actually meeting these people. So here it is, this Philadelphian who is meeting people up in Massachusetts and New York and up into the Coos country that is Vermont and New Hampshire. 
he is meeting them and he is making these distinctions about are they like us or unlike us? Are they with us or they are not with us in some form? And we explain that to all of the thousands and tens of thousands who were part of that army at that time, taking what is imagined and making it real in some form or another. So we come back to that reality as we look at Hawkins. So I wanted to pick it up, especially in this one aspect, Coup's Country Campaign. This was in 1779. So even before this, a year before this in 78, there was talk about a possible another invasion into Canada. General Lafayette was given charge of that possible invasion in 78, is let's move up and go for it. Certainly Hazen was gung-ho for this. Yes, let's get back to Canada. I have my estates back there. I, you know, I want to get my lands back, the rest of it. And it went nowhere. Okay, that was the end of it in 78. They could not get the supplies. They could not get the support. Quite frankly, General Washington was not real fond of the idea either. He had other things he needed to do in 78 instead of worrying about Canada. So it was put on a back burner. Then on the 6th of March, 79, Washington ordered Hazen's regiment to move into the Coos country. So at that point, Hazen's regiment had spent the winter at what was called Putnam's Folly, which is outside of Reading, Connecticut, one of the largest encampments through this war, and probably about the largest inhabited area at that point in Connecticut, uh, in there, so this big town. And they were given the orders to start marching north into the Coos country, and then eventually to, to build a road or cut a road from Haverhill, New Hampshire, which is up at the top there, through into what were the New Hampshire grants, also called the pretended state of Vermont at that point, and to move up towards the Canadian border. So this was the orders. Now, what was the reason for it? Hazen's orders were, you are to scout the area, build a road, and engage the populace. So three components to that mission. He wanted Hazen in particular to discover whether the inhabitants would support an expedition from Cuez to Canada. And so he's saying, go out there and do it, especially if they were to do it with the French support, which by that time, America had. So he was going, you know, why don't you go up and do that? Hazen is delighted to take his regiment up there to do this. Now, what he didn't realize and what Washington did not tell him is that this was actually part of Washington's greater strategy, which threefold could be seen as a strategy of disinformation out to the enemy and those who are within the colony or the states as well as up to Canada, a diversion against the enemy in Canada. So if they think the enemy is coming one way, they might not be watching as closely in another direction. And that also, ultimately, a bone to throw to people like Hazen, who had kept harassing him, remember he had that obstinate temper, about making an invasion into Canada. Can you all figure why Washington wanted a diversion in the spring and summer of 79? What do we got? Look a little over there to New York on that border. You may have heard of General Sullivan and a campaign against the Native Americans into New York to move against that enemy. So wouldn't it make a lot of sense if you're sending Sullivan up one way to have Hazen create a diversion in another locale? It's a feint, all right? Move him in a different direction. So Hazen's delighted and he sends his troops up. And this brings us back to Hawkins then. Hawkins describes what he is seeing on that trek that you see listed on there. So they're basically following the Connecticut River Valley, moving up into New Hampshire and then across into what will be Vermont. So he describes the various towns and peoples of this trek. They move out in three divisions, essentially what would have been three battalions within the regiment itself as they saw it, moving up first through to Springfield, Massachusetts. At Springfield, Hawkins records, at daybreak on 14 April, 
All three divisions march out, followed by a baggage train. He records eight wagons, 21 teams, 21 teams to be pulling these wagons. Those have got to be really heavy wagons, and they definitely are, because what's on them? Loaded with spades, shovels, axes, picks, carbines, horsemen's swords, pistols, and other military stores. Carpenters' tools, armorers' tools, provisions. They are out to really cut this road and they're taking all the tools with them. So think for a minute what that would look like to the communities through which this baggage train is going with these soldiers in these three divisions who may not have seen a lot of soldiers up to this point, but they are moving through. This is part of Hazen engaging the populace. It is not just the tools to cut the road. This is, if you will, to show the flag in this area. This is a borderland on this revolutionary frontier where much of the action is beyond there, but they are not forgotten. Okay, we're sending troops up there to deal with issues they are worried about. And of course, Hazen's still hoping he'll get his lands back. So we've got that part. So they've got that, and they're trailing behind their own traveling forge. If they break their, um, their tools, they can fix them. They've got that in the wagon trail as well. So again, they're marching out. We've got all of these animals, all of these wagons moving out to show the force of the Continental Army, and by extension, congressional authority, that they're moving on that into these hinterlands. This is part of creating that political community as well as sending the military up. So they started marching in hilly territory, but Hawkins is looking there. Oh, where are the level roads? Where's the beautiful pine tree country where the trees are shading the road on a hot day? That's really important when you're wearing woolens and you're marching up through this and it's warm. So where are the fine houses and the farms? He looks at Northampton. What a handsome and large village, though much scattered. Checking it out, how does this work? But he goes, the court of justice is small but very elegant house. Inside work is very grand. So other things, pointing out how people are living. So he's praising some areas that he goes through, and then he denigrates others. Swansea, for instance, was despicable. Okay, all right, not good for any PR there. Walpole, oh lordy, Walpole. Where he found the troops much scattered, some in dwelling houses and other in barns. The poor, mean, despicable, wretched town could not afford one regiment room in their dwelling houses for one night. This is the first night that our men has been under the necessity of lying in barns on this march. So fascinating point. In this, he's revealing that as they have been marching through these communities, they have been quartered in people's homes. The inhabitants along this trek have been welcoming these soldiers into their homes. They've not had to lay out under the, um, the stars or at that point, up to that point, in barns. Now, I will point out that it could be all welcoming. At another point or two, as we look at what Hazen is doing, he was also perfectly willing to threaten councilmen along the way. That if you are not willing to give us the supplies that we need, for instance, flour, then we'll take it. If you don't let us stable our horses in your barns, we will then put them in anyway, and we will stay there until you supply. So again, that obstinate temper, either be very willing to do it or we'll use a little bit of authority to get what we want. But so that was part of it, but it was interesting that the despicable one is the one that makes the men sleep in the barn. These other ones, these wonderful communities, are welcoming the soldiers into their homes. So he was very happy to leave miserable Walpole 
that was on the 24th of April, arrive in Charleston. Handsome, though small, but lovely. It resembled Princeton, New Jersey. So again, there's this other side to it where he's taking what he knows and comparing what he's just meeting. Hey, they're like us. They're like Princeton up there. You know, hey, we've got these connections. They're part of our community in doing this. And then he also pointed out the other side of the Connecticut River is what is called the state of Vermont, but which is in dispute at that time. Okay, so he's observing and recording. He's examining what is different, what is similar, what is common among these various regions and peoples. There were certainly some unpopular or some unfavorable comparisons, but quite frankly, he was often very positive about what he was seeing. I will say he was also always looking for future opportunities in this. Um, the thing that we see with Hawkins is he couldn't make it as a printer down here in Philadelphia. I think there was a surplus of printers down here in Philadelphia at the time. But he was certainly looking out there and you see things like, hmm, Albany, do you have a printing press there I see that nobody's using? Well, he was drafting a letter to say, would you be interested in letting me have it, setting something up? He looked at what was up at Dartmouth College. Oh, they've got a printing press. Wonderful. This Liberty of Liberties is the printing press. Um, he thought this was great. That is true civilization, is to have a press. So he's out there looking for other opportunities. And you go, this is what other soldiers were doing as well as they're marching through is are they gonna go back home or are they gonna look for opportunities elsewhere? So in the process of all of this, Hawkins was checking this out as Hazen's regiment was out there collecting intelligence, denying intelligence to the enemy, as they were saying it, because they were also sending elements up into Canada at that point, checking in with Native Americans, um, trying to have Native American allies or at least keeping them neutral if nothing else in there, and making sure that the newer settlers were protected um, from and also made sure that they were not engaging with the enemy at that point. So again, the regiment was showing the flag as it was moving into the borderland to cut the invasion route. So as it did, and by the end of August, Hazen had indeed cut that route up to what is now called Hazen's Notch, and it's right there below the Canadian border. He was very close. He was within sight of the Canadian border when he got orders from Washington to return. That Washington had gotten what he wanted out of this expedition. The feint had worked. Sullivan's expedition was successful. It was time for Hazen to bring his regiment back so that it would be ready for engagements through the rest of 79 and moving into 1780 at that point. So with this, and I know I'm coming to the end of this, they do continue on. If we go back to what you've said, after the Coos Country campaign through there, they went back to Morristown. The regiment suffered through the hardships of Morristown in winter encampments there in 1780. The regiment did march to Yorktown in 1781. Hazen um, Hawkins was very good about recording that one as well, the long trek down into Yorktown, what he was seeing there. At Yorktown, the regiment did distinguish itself, in particular its Light Infantry Company, which had been attached to Lafayette's Light Infantry Corps through that summer of 1781. And the Light Infantry Company of Hazen's regiment was part of the assault party under Hamilton on readout number 10 which beat the French who were trying to take readout number nine at the exact same time through it. By, after Yorktown, the regiment was sent up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, not too far from here, if you will. And they were on guard duty with the prisoners of war there, where I would like to point out that Hazen again was pressing for an invasion of Canada. Um, through into 1782, you know, let's do it. And of course, you're, everybody's waiting for the diplomats to get everything done, to get the peace treaty. Let's end this. And there is Hazen going, come on, we have one last chance. Let's go for Canada again. And I love it. Washington writes him back going, interesting, send me your plans. 
You know, and I think this is great as as a senior officer, he's going, write it out for me about how this would actually work. And the trouble is, it only kept Hazen occupied for a few weeks, and then he already had sent the plan back. But at that point, Washington had other things for them to do. They were brought back up to New York, spent most of the rest of the war up at Pompton waiting for the furlough. Um, most of the troop was furloughed in July, by June, July of 1783. One small contingent of it then continued up to West Point, um, between West Point and Newburgh, where they stayed until the army was totally disbanded in November of 1783. So here was a regiment that served from basically from 1776, when it was authorized in January, to November of 1783. And in it, Sergeant Major John H. Hawkins was with it from 1777 through to 1783. And I am very thankful that he left us a journal to see part of this regiment's travels. Thank you very much. Shall we? See Tyler behind you. We gotta, so just raise your hand. Uh, maybe I'll kick things off um, as soon as our contingency plan comes into effect here with our handhelds. <laughs> um, I really appreciated your, your, your casting the role of the Continental Ar Army as a sort of nationalizing force. You know, it's something that for those of you who are familiar with our core exhibition here at the museum, you recall that very dramatic tableau scene with the life cast figures of the snowball fight with George Washington breaking up this fight between New England and um, Virginia soldiers. And we did that, of course, because we wanted to remind or for the first time tell visitors that the nation did not spring out of, uh, you know, uh, the heads of the men who were gathered down the street here, but that it was a really hard, long process, perhaps an ongoing process that is still uh, going on. A little bit later in the core exhibition, you see that display of um, soldiers' buttons from the period of uh, 1777 and the um, Valley Forge encampment when USA, of course, was first printed on, you know, in, in Boston, the buttons worn by soldiers on the uniforms. And one of the things we, we wanted to convey is this is actually the first time most Americans would have seen, you know, we chant USA. The first time that appears, of course, is on the bodies on this, of these Continental Army soldiers. So I think, um, you know, this regiment, uh, again, being a regiment without a country uh, is just an incredible embodiment of that, of that process. Um, they very much were. When you start looking at the, the rosters, at the end of this war, uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Benjamin Moores, who was actually the nephew for Hazen, started mm -hmm. to do a roster. They were pulling all the names together. Actually, mm -hmm. Hawkins was part of that. He had also done part of the roster and moved them mm -hmm. together, which is that master roster had about, um, I counted, 1,482 soldiers on that roster. And then I also did more research and pulled out another 300 or so that weren't on it. Many mm. of them were the French Canadians who had left or stayed <laughs> in Canada instead of coming down at the retreat. So again, we get into about 1,900 mm. men with them. But on that roster, they didn't all have places where they came from which was absolutely important because later on when they wanted their bounty lands and the rest, they had to have a state affiliation by which to get it. But about 300 of those names just had U.S. after them. Mm. In other words, they had no state affiliation. They only had the United States affiliation. Um, and then after that, we saw the Pennsylvanians and the New Yorkers <laughs> and New Jersey and the like that you saw. But mm. that U.S. was essential for the French Canadians. It was also essential for some of the foreigners who did. So we did have some um, prisoners. Some of the prisoners of war at Lancaster joined mm -hmm. Hazen's regiment. Um, Germans more than the English in that case. Mm -hmm. um, others had also joined. So it was very much a multi-ethnic, multilingual regiment there with the Continental Army. What, uh, what happened to Sergeant Major Hawkins after 1783? Oh, that's <laughs> the hard part. Um, 
Sergeant Major Hawkins almost disappears. There's only two other records I was found, and they were both about bounty lands in particular, mm -hmm. as he was selling them off or distributing them elsewhere. And basically, by 93, I can't find him. I actually went into the records for the yellow fever hospitals to see whether he died in one <laughs> of the hospitals to see whether that mm -hmm. happened. I couldn't find his name. I was a little relieved by that point. Um, mm -hmm. I did find at least two John Hawkinses in the Philadelphia directories. And one was more of a cobbler and another is a grocer. And I think, you know, it's possible. If he is who I think he was, he may have had some experience with leather working in the family. I'm more inclined to think he could be a grocer. With his experience, mm. it would have been <laughs> relatively easy for him to set that up. Mm -hmm. um, and to go into trade. He definitely did not become a farmer, as far as I know. <laughs> he didn't disappear. I think mm -hmm. he was too urban for that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have that kind of experience. But I spent a lot of time trying to do it, because I was determined, I am going to find this <laughs> guy. I have got to. He left this marvelous journal. I have been spending <laughs> all this time reading about him. I want to meet him, you know, yeah. this, this kind of thing, more than Hazen. He's an uh-uh, you know, <laughs> problem. But Hawkins, I really wanted to meet. And I couldn't. And finally, one of my colleagues, after I was spending way too long, she says, you know, that's part of the story here, hmm. is that so many of the people that we have named on these rosters, this is all we've got of them. Hmm. This, that we know that they live, we have their name, and we have nothing else. Hmm. So we know more about him, but he also represents so many of these soldiers who came in, enlisted, hmm fought, and disappeared. Do we know where those journals were between him disappearing into the ether and them ending up at HSP, or um, how they came into the collection there? I have not seen it, but if we want to talk to the There's HSP... There's a guy over there that might be able to help us with this. <laughs> ...about where yeah. they were. I will say what is evident in this, at some point they were bound together and so they were actually, when he was writing them, they were in smaller, like paper bound, mm. kind of, or stitched together pages. And that at some point, somebody decided to put them within a leather bind binding. Mm. And when they did, there are one or two pieces that were bound out of order. So I was going, it stops here, but then <laughs> let's not go into this mm. page. And mm -hmm. then I find it later on in the journal. So there was a little bit of a difference. And if you take a good look at the journal, you will notice that the pages are of different sizes mm. and the different chunks there mm. that, again, is showing where this first came from and that the binding is later mm. for this. Mm. But yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. I'm going to throw the first question to one of our guests watching from home. This is from Riley Sutherland, who clearly, like us, is a fan of your past research. Uh, Riley asked, did Dr. Mayer's research reveal anything about the Canadian women attached to Hazen's regiment? And if so, did their experiences differ from uh, other camp followers and women that we know of in the American Revolutionary British forces? Absolutely. And I managed to get a little bit in air um, about the women with the regiment there. I couldn't leave camp followers out. There's no way. Um, what we do know is that women and children did um, also retreat with the French Canadians at the retreat from Canada. Moses Hazen's wife, Charlotte, was also a refugee. Um, Edward Antill's wife was a refugee. She also kept bearing children in camp and losing about half of them in camp through the process of this war. There were certainly other soldiers that had their wives and their children with them in camp. And what is interesting is that within a few years, at least with the French Canadians, seeing that some of the soldiers who had come down are starting to marry the daughters of the other soldiers who had come down. So they were maintaining their community ties in the camps. So it is that it was much older soldiers with teenage daughters, but then if you look at the regulations, at some points there, they were saying women over the age of 14 would not be allowed to be in camp separately. And you go, well, at that point, you get married and you get rations and you're allowed to stay in camp. Um, I did not find as many women following with the Anglo soldiers and certainly not with the 
deserters from the German or the British side coming in with them. Yeah. But most of the time, that's they could stay closer to home. So one of the things with camp followers to always remember is, are they coming out of areas in which there is action or has been taken by the enemy? And so they are following because they're also refugees, not simply because of the funding. But yes, they are there. They are in the book. <laughs> Got them. I'm curious, um, can you talk a little bit about sort of fast forwarding to the 19th century when those who have survived to the pension acts in 1818, 1832, like what were you able to find out through, uh, through those sources, which I think should be known by all Americans. I mean, this is the first oral history archive of an American conflict, 80,000 pension records in the National Archives, and, and it, it's still such a it's a marvelous. bountiful <laughs> field to plow. So what did you learn about the well, COR? First, you find out that the best records usually come after the 1820 pension mm. record, when they are saying you've got to show need mm. um, and what do you own, what you don't own, and they're making this. By the time you get into the 1830s, at this point, they're just going, you survived, okay. We can, <laughs> you know, we can pension you off at that point. But in the 1830s also is when the widows could ask for the pensions based on their, their husband's service, the soldier's service. And they would have to give proof of, were you actually married? Um, the first of the accounts said, were you married during the war? Then later on, were you married within so many years of the war? And then finally it was, well, when do, you know, it didn't matter when you married the veteran. It's just that you had been married to one of these soldiers. But what was tremendous, and where I got most of the records for this, was actually among the French Canadians is because actually Congress or the War Department was tending to push against some of them, especially going, well, that means that she got married when she was 13. No, 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 that can't be. There's got to be something wrong. Well, no, they actually mm. did marry mm. at 13 in some of these cases, mm. and here are the reasons why. Mm. And they would try to get more information from these women. Most of them were illiterate, and mm. she can't write her name, and she doesn't mm. know this stuff, but she can give the story or or tell tales about, well, we stood up in the barracks before everybody in the company and declared that we were married with the company commander there to supervise this. So it was a common law marriage. And then for them, they were waiting until a priest would arrive and they could actually do the sacramental marriage at this point, which did happen. Um, there was a missionary priest by the name of Father Farmer who went up to the encampments up there, and he married some of them and baptized some of the children. So we've got that, but what they were doing is then telling us these little intimate details of their life, at least when they thought they got married, um, if they had had children while they were still in camp with them at some point. But the other part that was tremendous is that they had maintained the community. For many of those French Canadians, New York State gave them bounty lands. And, they, and those bounty lands were up past Plattsburgh. So they're right smack dab there on the Canadian border. Some of them were within 50 miles of where they had lived before the war. Mm. So they're right close to home again at that point. And they had created a community up there. And then in the pension accounts, you've got sister being witness to sister. Um, to being witness to a brother's children, to then their children are representing their, their parents in these accounts, but they really were all very much a strong community this way. So it was, yeah, a great other story there. That's oh, a great, it's certainly been a theme of much of your work is thinking of these institutions, whether they're regiments, armies, as, as communities. And, um, you know, I really think they stay through. together better if they become a community. Mm -hmm, is sure. That they have yeah. that sense of affiliation with them. Yeah. Um, and as I said, it is also picking up on this idea of creating a community that is a nation. So mm -hmm. you've got the smaller communities and then that bigger one that keeps growing from that. Mm -hmm. I'll ask another question from our friends on the internet. Um, Walt Jaranek is wondering if John Hawkins says anything about uh, the famous cabals and um, inside dealing that those of us who have been studying the later years of the Revolutionary War might have heard of? Not as much. I wish he would. There are quite a few gaps in his record. 
Um, part of it, as you would see there, is he lost part of his journal when he was running away from that Highlander at Brandywine. <laughs> Um, there was another account when he was up at Albany. They had marched up from Wilmington to Albany for that first so-called eruption into Canada in 78. Mm -hmm. And his, his, he had lost stuff out of his pocket that he thought was stolen. And there went another journal at mm -hmm. that point. So there had been, so there are gaps in the record mm -hmm. at that point. What I do see at the end, and this was before the Newberg conspiracy, as he was talking about Hazen and Hazen's military family all together in Errant Schuyler's house up there. And they're sitting around and he's trying to write in his journal and he's trying to write letters and people are singing and dancing all around him. And then the housekeeper apparently at that point kept just trying to push his stuff aside, you know, and he's saying, I'm in, I'm in fear of my life right now as she's brandishing knives at me to put down on the table to set the table for dinner. So he was, he was talking more about things that intimately concerned him mm. as opposed to those, those greater events. I would have loved to have seen the account about the mutiny at New Jersey. Hazen's regiment was part of putting that down, but there, it's, that's one of the gaps mm. in the journal. I was about to call on John Reese. <laughs> Uh, Holly, could you could you tell us what you know about uh, any African Americans with the uh, with the regiment? I did look this up. I was checking it out. There were a few African Americans in Hazen's regiment, but what made it difficult is that in the rosters they were not putting down race next to the soldiers' names. They put down where they came from because that's where they were to be supplied and paid but there was no indication of race. So what I started to do is I was researching some, part of what we can do sometimes is by naming. There's a name that seems like it was often associated with African Americans, and if I ran across that name, I would try to research it. And I did find a few that way by tracing them back through census accounts. So um, Kate's, who could have been Cato Mumford at one point, was found as a free person of color up in Connecticut, but he was never noted that way in the regiment itself um, for it. Another person that I came across, so I found about three or four is really all I could say for sure that I had corroborating evidence to say that this was a person of color. One was John Saratoga. Now he's an interesting character in this. No indication whatsoever about race. Where I found out was later on at the end of the war is that Edward Chin, who was the paymaster of the regiment, put in the paperwork saying that all monies due to John Saratoga were to go to him for he is my slave for life. So here we know that we had, um, so Kate's Munford was a free person of color and then we've got John Saratoga who is an enslaved person both serving in the regiment on the rolls. Um, Major John Taylor from Virginia brought an enslaved servant with him and registered him into the regiment so that he was getting then rations and pay through his enslaved um, servant. So we do know that they were there there were other accounts for Putnam's regiment at one point about like 27 men and Hazen's regiment was part of Putnam's regiment and they said there were 27 African Americans with the regiment at that time. Some of them were probably in Hazen's regiment. But so I was really trying to track them down but I, I found it very interesting they did not make that designator. And what does that mean that they are not making that designator on these troops? We, before we give everyone the opportunity to get their book signed, to appreciate the amazing artifact we have on loan from HSP, or to imagine what that knapsack contained with our recreation, uh, it is our long tradition for Scott Stevenson to have the final question. <laughs> I do like to have the final word, as you know. <laughs> I'm curious, have, have portions, uh, presumably not all of the diary has been in, published. I'm just curious if... Um, 
Well, what would you like to say about that? Um, with it, I did in the midst of doing this. This is one of the things where your research, if you will, goes wrong or right. I'm not sure where it is. But when I first came across um, the Sergeant Major's journal, and he is my Sergeant Major, is I started to think, ah, oh, this would be a great thing to transcribe, annotate, and then publish as a primary source mm -hmm. for use. So I ended up, I've transcribed the entire journal. I've got the transcription in my records, but I got so involved going, every time I was gonna annotate something, well, I gotta learn more. <laughs> I gotta learn more. And the next thing you know, it's, I think I'm writing a monograph here. <laughs> I think I've got some other story in this. So I, there's a part of me that is still thinking, maybe I should still go back and publish this primary source for use in schools and elsewhere. Um, whether or not that's as important anymore as we do more and more digital history is, is the question. If I don't go in that direction, I am gonna give the transcription to HSP. It doesn't make sense that it just stays on my computer at that point. Yeah. <laughs> well, the second half of my final question is just um, more broadly, as we approach the 250th anniversary uh, of the Declaration of Independence, going to be somewhat of a, a celebration, I hope, here in Philadelphia. I'm just curious, what are you, uh, what are you thinking about? What are your aspirations? What are you worried about? Uh, Open-ended question, but uh, how are you reflecting on, uh, you know, the commemoration anniversary that's coming up? Well, I'm certainly hoping I'm still going to be here to celebrate that, you know, <laughs> with it all. Um, Actually, right now I'm just working, I'm actually an editor for a volume on Women Waging War. It is a collection of essays about the women's side of this war. In it, it's under contract with UVA Press, and so that should be coming out next spring. So that's the project in the near term, and then it may be a revisiting Sergeant Major Hawkins. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Holly, for joining us here tonight. For those of you who are interested in um, having a book signed, I'm going to usher Dr. Mayer out the door for just a quick, uh, well-deserved uh, break for a minute or two. But uh, Tyler, I think you're gonna organize uh, a line here. Otherwise, thank you all for uh, helping us to usher back in in-person events here at the museum. And I look forward to seeing, I hope, all of you uh, next month uh, for Gordon Wood. Thank you.